Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Meet La Prensa. We have a return guest today and a friend of show, Rafael Bernal from The Hill. Rafael, thank you so much for coming back to Meet La Prensa. Hey, always happy to be here. So Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas of the Department of Homeland Security on Friday fired pretty much his entire Homeland Security advisory staff. What the heck is going on over at DHS? Well, I mean, it, it is a bold move, certainly. Um, what's going on at DHS, uh, I suspect, has to do with achieving full operational control of, of the institution. Let's remember, it's a 200,000 plus member institution. Like, it has more than 200,000 employees. It's huge. Uh, you see a lot of... Uh, a lot of off messaging by by certain leaders. You, you have the uh, the border patrol chief in the Rio Grande Valley, for instance, keeps using the term illegal aliens on on Twitter. Um, after Mallorca said that they're not they're not using that term anymore. So you can, there's a lot of um, there's a lot a lot of Trumpists that wait from the perspective of, of Mallorcas. And it's gonna it's gonna be hard to control them. Now this advisory board, let's remember it's an unpaid advisory board. Usually people that serve out three uh I think it's three year terms. And they're just people who get together and talk about the priorities of DHS. Obviously the priorities of DHS, an, an organization that's become very immigration centric, uh probably to the detriment of its national security side, which should scare us all, frankly. Um obviously changed course radically from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. So it makes sense that the same advisory board wouldn't be able to do the work of a Biden immigration policy as it did of a Trump immigration policy. So it's really, I mean, Mallorca has to clean house, but he has to do it quietly while also dealing with a, he calls it a challenge, his opposition calls it a crisis, but an ongoing situation at the border that is not going to go away. You know, you, he can't will it away as much as as much as DHS under Trump tried to will it away. We're talking about a regional migration phenomenon that's a long term. I like to call it a phenomenon, right. not a crisis, not an issue, not a problem. It just is what it is and it won't go away. So right. DHS has to build the tools to manage the situation. Right. We've been calling it a story. So the border story instead of the border phenomenon or the border crisis or the border challenge, because um, I don't know, on the one hand, I think that, you know, we risk falling into too much semantics and not focusing yeah. on the objective, which is to make a better country, um, but a better country policy wise in terms of actually like creating the kind of relief and the kind of changes that need that are needed so that this isn't the only story that people focus on when it comes to the Latinx community in this country. Um, in terms of institutional challenges, though, the government wasn't the only problematic area when it came to this border story. Actually, the institutions of higher journalism faced a lot of criticism last week, including from our guest yesterday, Julio Ricardo Varela, who wrote a bombshell opinion piece in the Washington Post opinions about the use of words like surge and and other words that are like more akin to like invasions. And, and you know, it's, it's like they're using the, the, the playbook for covering the D-Day invasion of Europe to describe what's happening with these, you know, children wandering out of the mist around the Rio Grande seeking our help. And if, in a nation that we've historically had the brand of helping uh, immigrants. So I guess given the challenges that happened last week, what would you as somebody who's been covering and who's in the business and has been on this beat for so long, what would you like to see the news business do differently this week on the border phenomenon or story? Well, it's it's absolutely what we just said. And first, let me say that Julio knocked it out of the park. Um, I, I think he's absolutely right. The, the comparisons to either sort of a wartime situation or really kind of looking like it's uh, sports casting, um, that, that is, does not benefit the story. It's also the reason why I'd like to call it, you know, a, a migration phenomenon because it is a regional issue. And and what what newsrooms really have to think about is the permanence of the issue. So what we've been doing in 2014, 2019, and now 2021, we go and and I'm saying we as the press in general, some some very good exceptions in in the immigration media, but so the press goes and covers it as a crisis. 
but this crisis keeps happening. Like every now, it's every four years, every two years. Uh, but but it's it's part of the same regional conditions that have existed since the 1930s, really, uh, since since Latin American populations sort of blossomed um, and, and made those countries more competitive, but also uh, the, the poverty was more difficult to manage than before. You know, when when a country like Mexico had the size it does, and it has made maybe 10 million people before the revolution, I think, I think that was the number. Um, it was so sparsely populated that you know, population movements didn't really, they didn't really register. So what hmm. what I would do as the press is sort of take a step back, look at this globally, and wait, what are we looking at? Much like migration patterns um, in Europe and, you know, the Middle East, and, and those have different also cultural challenges that we don't really have as much here in the Americas. But this is a continuous, like, that's why I like the word phenomenon. It's just I can't get out of that word. It is a migration phenomenon that will continue while you have a more productive economy in the United States and Canada, and especially the United States, and less productive economies down there. Those you economies can Sorry. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry, my, my, my those mind. those economies don't have the capacity to use their um, their human resource to its fullest. The United States has a need for more of that human resource. That I mean, that is just basic economics. I mean, you can look at the the Cato Institute. Not exactly the most liberal place in D.C. The Cato Institute keeps saying that it's just a matter of supply and demand. And while right. that continues, you know, the phenomenon will continue. So, so covering it like, oh my God, it, you know, this just happened. It's like, well, no, this has been happening for about a century. So have, you know. have organizations like the Cato Institute and before them, I remember I mentioned to Julio yesterday in our interview with him that in 2010, Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox News and the New York Post, which is now destroying immigrants on a daily basis, both major properties in this anti-immigrant xenophobic push in the United States. In 2010, Rupert Murdoch created a nonprofit organization with Michael Bloomberg to push for an amnesty package in Congress. You know, the Cato Institute obviously has these uh, you know, it's, it's known as a very conservative, libertarian type of like entity, but it, yeah, too, it seems to be a lot more aligned with the immigration movement that you see like marching in the street with mariposas on their back, you know, chanting and things like that. Are we missing an opportunity when we focus so much on the language of immigration, like, ah, oh, no human being is illegal or whatever, um, instead of just kind of like creating a broad bodied consensus with some big media and policy billy clubs? to push our way forward as an immigrant community in this country. So that's the challenge, because you can either educate, you know, about, about all of this historical stuff that I'm talking about, educate all members of the press, and, and whenever, you know, immigration pops up to the uh, political forefront, people know what they're talking about and will avoid those words because they don't describe the situation. We're not avoiding those words because they're not politically correct. They're, they're, they're not politically correct because they're wrong you know because they don't describe the actual situation of what is happening and that is giving bad information to your readers now on the you know there's also the political side where opposition to immigration because that's what we're talking about on the political opposition to immigration which means opposition to having more people come to the united states whether they're economically needed or not and you know most evidence suggests that they are economically needed. Uh, but that opposition to immigration has been effective in the polls, has won elections in the 90s in California, in the 2000s in Arizona, in 2016, it got Trump to the presidency. Republicans cannot ignore that if they're looking at things from a purely political lens. So, Fair. you know, you'll have trips like, like Ted Cruz's trip to the border. They believe that that action is part of keeping Texas red in 2022. And frankly, they have a very good argument to believe that. Now, as an immigrant community, do you have to like that? Was well, most certainly not. But the politics are going to be there regardless. And the press's job is sort of to look beyond the politics and say, you know, are we looking like at a crisis? I'm, we're looking at a 
the housing crisis for minors that was provoked in part by Biden's policies and, and mostly by the policies that Biden kept from the Trump administration. That the, the part that he didn't erase the Trumpism on at the border is provoking the housing crisis. But a crisis of how many bunk beds does DHS and HHS have is not exactly like the uh, world ending crisis that um, you know, 12 Republican senators would right. believe they just saw on the Rio Grande. Right. It seems like every time it's like, an epi- it's like a scene from World War Z when you listen to him talk. And I think that one of the things that sending so many parachute reporters to the border to cover immigration when, you know, in many cases, they don't speak the language of the migrants coming over the border and have no experience on the issue or no deep experience anyway, reporting on the issue just opened up the floodgates for people like Ted Cruz to wander down into the reeds upon the Rio Grande and become the correspondent. So you mentioned human resources and the allocation of human resources. You mentioned sort of the overperformers in immigration media. Who are right now the most underrated underrated workers in the American news business? Well, I I, I don't know about underrated, but I I, I got to pitch Julio's uh, Julio's column in the Washington Post. Julio it, Ricardo it, Varela, yeah. Julio Ricardo Varela. It, it just it described perfectly. One, I mean, just one of those several angle, angles of why using this language does it do good to the story, you know? And 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 I think that's really important. The the more that we internalize it, and you you know, parachute reporters, general assignment reporters, whatever, we all have to understand the issue we're covering. And if immigration is going to be a top issue, and you know, read up, you know, don't don't, don't cover it like it's the first time this has ever happened, because. Um, Literally hasn't. It hasn't even been the first time in the last two years. Um, and Aida Chavez just just moved to uh, to a new job. Uh, I think I mentioned her last uh, last time. I really like her writing. Uh, I, I think that's. I mean, she's a thorough reporter. She's a she's a, she's a good worker. But but the style of her writing really speaks to me, and it's it's very passionate. And, and you know, I, I I I like reading her stuff. So um, I think she is underrated. Actually, I think. She should she should be a top five contender week in and week out. I couldn't agree more. I love her writing and I love the instincts that she has in pers- in, the, in the specific stories that she tends to pursue. They tend to be the ones that are overlooked but incredibly important. She was one of the only reporters who picked up on Biden's promise or on candidate Joe Biden's promise to um, enact a deportation moratorium on the first day of his presidency, a promise obviously the, he eventually actually did deliver on, but she was the one who noted that it didn't make his website during the campaign, which was uh, a sharp, a very sharp um, um, uh, insight that I, even I had missed and I had been watching it very closely. So yeah, you can, um, you one can't last, put one past her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so one, one last question. Um, DHS, the number, DHS is saying that we're at a, and Secretary Mayorkas at the Department of Homeland Security is saying that this is a 20 year high in border crossings, or at least apprehension. Uh, how reliable is the data from DHS? I mean, obviously, some of the divisions within DHS, like Immigration and Customs Enforcement or ICE, are infamous for lying to the press. We know that the Department of Homeland Security is going to be going, for, going to Congress to look for money. Uh, to, to ask for money for its, in, in, in the new year, or to ask for its budget um, to be to be fulfilled. Um, so, to, is it? Would you say that DHS is a reliable source of that information, or do you think that this is a political number that for an agency looking to get paid? So, a lot to unpack there. The first thing is DHS has, and props to DHS, really has been consistently very transparent in giving its southwest border numbers. That's the number of people that get encountered by DHS agents, whether it's CBP or Border Patrol. Uh, at points of entry and between points of entry. The one number we cannot know because it is literally impossible to know is how many people sneak through because, you know, they snuck through. Nobody, there, there's a few, there's a count of runaways, like people that the Border Patrol wasn't able to catch, but it's really not a significant number since we don't know, like, how many how many people snuck through without being seen as runaways, right? So, so the, the but the estimate, well, no, the factual numbers of how many people were encountered by U.S. immigration officials at the southern border is good, and it comes out monthly, and it has been consistent through several administrations. So DHS does really well with that. Um, Excellent. 
whether Mallorca's is inflating the numbers for budget, that is an interesting question. Um, the, the one thing that is inflating numbers that we do know, we have like about 10,000 minors crossing. And let's remember to call them minors, not children, because there is a difference between a teenager and a child. Uh, speaking of language, I, minors is just more accurate. Uh, you have about 10,000 minors crossing uh, monthly, but you have a number that's about 100,000 encounters of different types at the border. The one thing that's driving this is is that Biden kept the Trump policy of what's known Title 42 expulsions, uh, expelling people under a CDC order because we're having a pandemic. So that they'll catch an adult at the border or a family unit at the border and they'll send them back to Mexico immediately, no questions asked. Now, the reason this is creating a you could argue falsely high number of, of apprehensions uh, a month because since there are no consequences to like try to cross again, somebody can get, you know, if, if a guy like jumps over the fence or walks around the fence one day, gets thrown back without even so much as registering paperwork, what's to stop him from trying again the next day? You know, and, and so that CDC order has been a cause of a lot of controversy well, first of all, because of, because of what it can do to the asylum process, you know, it, it can it can mean somebody doesn't get a fair shake at asylum, assuming they have a, a case. And second of all, because it's causing this recidivism that's just being inflationary and inflating numbers to, yeah, probably we're at a 20 year high. But um, but the, the specific circumstances of, of the border have changed during the pandemic. So it's a little bit apples and oranges. Well, Rafael, thank you so much for coming on. And Internet, thank you for joining another episode of Meet La Prensa. You can find Rafael's Twitter handle in the description for this video. Please hit smash to subscribe. Till next time. Bye.